Alfred Adler, the famous psychologist, had a 14 day cure plan. He's quoted as saying, you can be cured in 14 days if you follow this prescription. Try to think every day how you can please someone. And he put an ad once in a paper claiming that he could cure anyone of any mental or emotional difficulty in just those 14 days. And one day a woman who was extremely lonely came to see Adler. He told her then that he could cure her of her loneliness in just 14 days if she would follow his advice. She wasn't very enthusiastic, but still she asked, what do you want me to do? And Adler replied, if you will do something for someone else every day for 14 days, at the end of that time, your loneliness will be gone. Why should I do anything for someone else? She protested. No one ever does anything for me. And supposedly Adler joked, well, maybe for you it will take 21 days. <laughs> He is famously quoted as saying, to be human means to feel inferior. Well, thankfully, we don't have to come go to Adler for the cure of, of loneliness or to him for the cure of any of the struggles of our human condition. We have God's word, which reveals to us the cure for the human condition, and it gives us a hope for an abundant life and for eternal glory. And that's where we're going to turn to today, his word. But sometimes I think you'll agree with me, the Christian life can be a struggle. We know the good and beautiful life that God has called us to. We have God's spirit within us living, and yet we still struggle with sinful tendencies that are hard to shed. And sometimes you and I can get frustrated with the lack of our own obedience. Our marriages ought to be an example of oneness and grace and selfless service. But sometimes our tone of voice or the mean things we say, or the demands that we place on our spouse make us instead examples of discord, examples of hurt and egoism. Our relationships with other Christians, we know ought to show the world what love looks like and what godliness is. But then in some church gatherings, we sometimes see the members being backbiters or refusing to speak to each other or even sometimes hating one another. We know we ought to be examples of gentleness, of faithfulness, of self-control, but then under some circumstances, perhaps the stress is just enough or the pressure, and then we explode in anger or we say mean things to someone we love and abandon the loyalty we once had for a friend. Well, today we're going to learn why that struggle actually exists for the Christian, but also we're going to learn the pathway towards becoming the people that God wants us to be. For us to become the right living person that looks a lot more like Jesus, God's son. Because Paul will give us three imperative verbs. That is, three verbs which are commands. Telling us, here's what you need to do. Instructions. And so I've divided today's message into three points. And I want us to understand today that yes, our human condition is altogether affected by sin. Affected negatively. But here's the thing. God has set us free from sin so that we can live and be his instruments of righteousness. We have to understand a few things, though, that he has redeemed us from one dominion that's ruled by sin and cursed to die, and he's brought us into his dominion, where we now live a righteous life to God. We live under a new authority, not the law, but grace. And so in today's passage, Romans chapter 6 we're going to look at verse 11 through 14. I know perhaps sometimes some on the screen may be chapter 6, verse 12 to 14, but we need to understand verse 11 first as the first of these three imperatives and see if you can identify them as we read them. What are the three things that Paul is commanding us as Christians to do? Romans chapter 6, 11 through 14. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. That verse contained the first one. Did you notice it? Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. There was the second imperative in the negative form. Let not sin reign in your mortal bodies. And then verse 13, do not present your members as sin to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life 
and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you since you are not under law, but under grace. Did you notice the, the uh, imperative there? It's the word present, and it's mentioned twice. Do not present and then instead present. All right? So those are the three points that we have today. Let's take a look, first of all, at verse 11. Consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God. Now, if you've been following along here, you'll remember that chapter 6 and 7 in Romans are essentially Paul's address to three questions that could arise because he made a bold assertion in, verse, in chapter 5, verse 20. He made this bold assertion that says, where sin increased, God's grace abounded all the more. And he's just gone through explaining that the gospel of Jesus Christ is God's power to save all who believe God for their righteousness. And he talked about whether you're Jewish or you're Gentile, whether you have the law and the circumcision, or if you don't, all have sinned, he says. No one is righteousness, but all who believe God for their righteousness, they are the ones who will be saved. And that means believing in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus, his son, and receiving his perfect righteousness as a gift counted to us, and then we won't be judged for our sins. Ah, but what about those who've sinned so much? Those who've sinned so greatly? What about all of their heinous sins? Will they also be forgiven? Can they also be reconciled to God? And this is Paul's answer in all of chapter 6. Yes, absolutely. Because God's grace is not like our sins. It's greater than our sins. Where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Now, I know that there's people who have tried not to sin. They've thought of being good people. If they've been living by the golden rule, doing unto others, following the sacraments of the church, living religiously, their protest can almost be anticipated when Paul says grace is greater than sin. Because if sins can just be forgiven by God, if indeed no matter how many sins or how great they are, God's grace will just abound even more to me, then can't I just say that I now believe in Jesus, I receive his grace, I'm forgiven, and then I can go live my life indulging myself in every sinful way that I please, right? That's the natural response of someone who has been living under the law, someone who's been trying to live a just and righteous life. Have you heard anyone respond like that when you share the gospel with them, that you can actually be forgiven of all your sins, that you don't have to pay for your sins, that their response would be, well, then I could just go on sinning, couldn't I? Well, Paul has anticipated that question. Are we going to continue in sin that grace may abound? That's how chapter 6 begins. And then he demonstrates that the question, if you ask that question, that means you've completely misunderstood this grace of God that saves us. And today we reach the conclusion of that response. And then you'll notice in the coming weeks, it brings up another objection, which he also answers, which brings up a third objection, which he also answers. But today we reach the conclusion of his response and the essence to the question of, are we to continue in sin that grace may abound, is this. We wouldn't continue in sin because believing in Jesus means dying to sin like Jesus did and living a new life that we live to God like Jesus did. And that's why he ends in verse 14, we are not under law but under grace because receiving his grace means our sins are forgiven but also that we are no longer under the dominion where sin is our ruler. Instead, we are in a dominion where Christ is our ruler. So we are and we can only be dead to sin and alive to God if we are in Christ. Well, what does it mean to be in Christ? You have to believe that God has what he has revealed to us about his son and about his wrath and about Christ's righteousness that you and I can receive as a gift, not by works. And when we are in Christ, it means that Christ is now our representative and everything that he has won by his redemption is also true and beneficial to us. That's what it means when we are in Christ. So the first thing we have to do for us to really experience this Christian life that God has intended for us is that we have to consider ourselves already dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. For us to truly live a life that's set free from sin, we have to make this first very intellectual first step of faith. 
to believe this very important truth about Christ and about us. Because we begin to live a life that's set free from sin when we accept the fact that first of all, Christ has died and lives again. And because I am now in Christ, I have died with Christ and in him I live again. And so we have to consider ourselves dead to sin and today alive to God in Christ Jesus. And this word here, maybe you remember back in September when we talked about counted or considered. It can sometimes be translated to be reckoned or credited. It appears 40 times in the New Testament and 19 of those times are in the book of Romans. And of those 19 times, if you'll remember in chapter 4, 11 times Paul mentions this word about being counted as he was trying to exp uh, explain to us how Abraham believed what God had said to him about he and Sarah becoming parents for the very first time. At their age, that's humanly impossible. But Abraham believed God anyway. And Paul says that that faith was counted to him as righteousness. And perhaps you'll also remember how Paul would quote David. And not only can righteousness be counted to you, but also sin can not be counted against you. As he explained about David's uh, situation in David's psalm. And so none of those instances where counted is used were imperatives. They were indicatives, meaning this is already true, that God has counted Abraham's faith to him as righteousness. But here we have an imperative for us. In chapter 6, verse 11, Paul is giving us an instruction, telling us to count, to reckon, to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God. It is a reality that God has declared is true about you and me who believe in Jesus, and we have to accept it by faith. And if we accept it by faith, then we live like it's true. Take an example. You have someone you, that works for you on Monday that you tell them, you have to complete this product review by Thursday, because on Friday I have to present this product review to the board of directors, and I need your work. Because without it, you might as well not meet with the board of directors. Your presentation is incomplete. So you tell this colleague of yours on Monday, I need it by Thursday. And you emphasize to them, I have to tell the board today if we're not meeting on Friday. And confidently, your employee says to you, consider it done. Is it done? No. But what he's telling you is that it will be by Thursday and he will personally ensure it. He's saying to you, count on me, right? As though the product review was indeed finished. Now, you have to be wise, depending on how well you trust this person. Look at his work in the past, whether or not you can truly count on him as he's asking you to do, right? And then whether or not you should then make that decision to tell the board of directors the meeting's off, right? But thankfully, God is not like your employee because God is sovereign. Nothing can overrule him. God is all powerful. He can indeed keep every promise that he, keep, that he makes. God is creator. And as creator, God can even declare things into reality. So we just have to be aware of who we are in Christ. And who we are in Christ means that you and I live in, very, in two very distinct realities. Because of our faith in Jesus, we live in a reality, a dominion, a kingdom that is ruled by Christ. A kingdom that will last forever. Because we believe he was crucified. We believe he was raised from the dead. And there's plenty of historical evidence and eyewitness accounts for us to believe that. And we must therefore also believe that our old self, the one that was identified with Adam's sin, the one ruled by sin, the one under judgment of the law, was also crucified with Christ so that we can live a new life in him. So we live this reality of being in the dominion and the kingdom of Christ, but at the same time, we're currently living out this reality in our human bodies here on this earth, which we won't shed, these bodies we won't shed until one day we finally succumb either to disease, sickness, age, or physical destruction. But today, already today, we now live under grace. And as Paul says in verse 14, sin will have no dominion over you. So even though sin has no dominion over us, Paul still has an imperative for us. That's coming in verse 12, to not let sin reign over us. But first, for us to finish this point, we must consider it done. 
that we are already dead to sin and alive to God because we are in Christ Jesus. And by that we can live accordingly because God says it's done. And every action that you make springs from what you believe. How do I know what you believe? I can tell by your actions. If you board a plane that you hope will take you to the United States or wherever else it will take you, then you do so believing that all of the maintenance that was done on the plane was in good order, right? And if someone were to convince you that they saw the pilots in the bar a couple hours prior, and you believed that person, most likely you wouldn't get on that plane, right? So your actions display what it is you truly believe. And so the first thing we have to do is to believe that we truly are dead to sin and alive to God in Christ. And then comes the second imperative. Therefore, because you are dead to sin and alive to God, therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal bodies, that you would obey its passions. So here we are living in this reality of a dominion ruled by Christ, but living in these bodies that were once living in the dominion ruled by sin. And so you and I will still experience these fleshly passions, these desires and lusts and yearnings and cravings and longings, all of which seek fulfillment. But the key is here. You don't have to obey them anymore, especially because we now belong to Christ, are ruled by him. We have an enemy that longs to see us still obeying the passions of our mortal bodies as though sin still had dominion over us. But let us remember, sin no longer has dominion over us and death no longer has dominion over us. And therefore, let not sin reign in your mortal body. The word here for reign is the word for king or kingdom, rulership. And the word for dominion is really the word for Lord. And it's very much closely related. If you have a king, obviously he's your Lord. If he's reigning over you, you're in his dominion. And it's the, the idea is similar to someone who has authority over you, mastery over you. Someone you have to obey and submit to, surrender to. But it's an imperative verb here for us. Let it not reign. Do not let sin reign. What could reign over us? Sin. In what? In our mortal bodies. To make us do what? To obey its passions. So we are experiencing the reality of being in Christ, being under his authority and lordship. But while we do so, we still exist in these earthly mortal bodies that are temporary, that are physical, and these bodies still have passions. So the Greek word simply means a desire or craving. There's no distinction between evil desires or desires unless the context merits it. And so very often in the New Testament, when the New Testament uses this word passions, oftentimes in the context you can tell it's evil passions it's speaking of, like lusts or, or covetousness. Because our bodies have very natural desires. We all require feeding constantly, some of us, sleep. We all need our creature comforts. Our bodies have our sexual desires that long to be fulfilled. We have itches that need to be scratched and we have sore muscles that need to be pampering. That's the reality of these physical bodies we live in. Those desires aren't evil, they're human. But God has revealed to us in his law, through his word, modeled to us in his son, that there are some ways of fulfilling those desires that are sinful. They are immoral. They are evil. They're against his law. And then there are desires that God has also told us are evil desires in and of themselves, like envy and greed and covetousness and vengeance. But Paul is reminding us here that we are free, that we do not have to obey these passions of our mortal bodies because sin no longer reigns over us. Since you are not under law, but under grace, sin does not have dominion over you. You do not have to let it reign. It is possible for you to submit to its power, but you are not obligated to. As the old Puritans used to say, God does not take away our ability to sin. He gives us the power not to sin. So we have to allow, oh, sorry, we must not allow sin to reign over us because sin will have no dominion over us. And this is a very important truth. You and I who are followers of Christ are today under his authority. And it makes all the difference for us to realize we live under his authority if we want to experience the freedom that we have in Christ. So Paul is here using a present tense indicative to describe this very present reality. You are under grace. 
And then he uses a future tense indicative to describe the future that we want to experience. Sin will have no dominion over you, but it still requires obedience on our part. And therefore there is in the present tense imperative, let not sin reign over you. Here's another quote from a commentator, Douglas Moo. The victory over sin that God has won for us in Christ is a victory that must be appropriated. Put away, putting away those sins that plague us will be no automatic process, something that will happen without our cooperation. No, Paul insists, a determination of our own will is called for to turn what has happened in principle into actuality. And so when we try to fulfill the desires of our mortal bodies that are evil, or when we do something that God has already said to us is sinful to satisfy this normal desire that we have, we might mistakenly think, well, I had to. Or we might try to justify the deed by saying, I, I couldn't help it. Or the sheepish words of someone who says, the devil made me do it. Oh, how the devil would love for you to say that because he wants you to believe that you are still under his authority and under the authority of sin. As though you have to obey in the dominion of sin because he only wants us to believe that the only way for us to get rid of temptation is simply to cave in. He wants us to believe that the, this lie that Christ's redemptive work on the cross isn't enough. It's incomplete. It's powerless over sin's hold. But do you believe the truth? Do you believe what God says about you? And will you then make a conscious decision not to allow sin to reign over you? Because you too now are dead to sin and alive to God. It may take time. And over time we become more mature in our faith to get to where we can say no every time to every temptation. Or perhaps when we get to that point where we have that much self-control that when that passion rises... That, that stressful situation where we want to respond in anger or say something mean, that by God's grace we'll have the self-control not to say it or not to express it or not to do what we were supposed to. Let me give you an illustration. I've never served in the military, but I know some who do and who still are serving in the military. And you can imagine that under the authority of a general, an army person has to always stand to attention. As soon as the general uh, uh, enters the room, they must stand to attention. I assume salute as well. And then uh, not until the general says at ease can they be at ease. But you can imagine someone who's been serving a career in the army that when they one day retire and they're just at ease at a dinner party or, or having drinks with someone else and the general they used to serve under walks in. You can imagine that for that retired colonel or whatever uh, rank that he had, he might suddenly or she might suddenly feel like the need to raise their shoulders up and, and stand to attention and wait for the words that say, at ease, soldier. Even though they're no longer under the authority of that general. But it's just that natural habit, that natural reaction that comes when you suddenly see the person that you used to be under authority. And I've talked to these military guys and they say it's true. Daryl, last week, who you also uh, heard the testimony of, he says that even as he walks by, he feels his arm like wants to come up to get his salute ready, but then he has to realize, no, I don't have to salute anymore because he is retired. You still serve your country, but you're no longer under that authority that you may have been under before until you retired. Well, similarly, sometimes those old habits die hard. And sometimes we need to still be remind ourselves that we are set free from that authority. Not that that authority may have been a tyranny or a difficult authority to live, on, to live under, but certainly sin and death were a tyranny. And those habits need to be reformed so that we become more like the character of Christ in purity, in holiness, in humility, and in kindness. Now, would we really continue in sin now that we're set free? That's really the question. By no means, says Paul. Of course not. You wouldn't want to go back and serve the tyranny and the abusive authority of sin. You wouldn't want to go back to indulging your sinful passions of your body because you find much greater pleasure being satisfied in the longings of the Holy Spirit. So how do we get there? What's this third imperative for us? How do we make sure that sin does not reign in our mortal bodies? Well, here we go. Present yourselves is what he says here. Present yourselves, the members of your body. Because acts of righteousness require the use of our body's members. 
And so these verses we've looked at today are a great example of what it means that God has already accomplished something in us, and yet there's a command for what we have to do to experience that reality on a daily basis. Because for while we were under the law, we were subject to the curse of the law. And we failed miserably to abide by everything that we were commanded, but we've been rescued from under the law. No longer we have this, do we have the same relationship to it. Sin no longer holds the same sway over us. Here's another quote I want to read to you, also from Douglas Moo. The battle is a spiritual one, but it is fought and won or lost in the daily decisions the believer makes about how to use his body. See, we still have our mortal bodies. We live in th them, and it is still capable of doing something that God will call sinful. But we don't have to anymore. And so that's why he says, do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness. We may be tempted to fulfill a desire in a way that would be contrary to the will of God. But if we don't offer the members of our body to do it, then we won't be able to commit that sin, will we? It has to be using our members of our bodies, our brain, our eyes, our tongue, our hands, our sexual organs. We have to engage them, whether it's acts of unrighteousness or acts of righteousness. So instead of presenting them for acts of unrighteousness, Paul says, present yourselves to God and your members as instruments of righteousness. These bodies, our bodies, the members of our bodies can be dedicated to God's use. He can use them as instruments for righteousness for good deeds, for edifying words, for helpful actions, for life-saving endeavors, for caring for the sick, for feeding someone who's hungry, for doing productive work to provide for our families. And anything that's dedicated for the Lord for His use is no longer for common use. It is now sanctified. And that's what Paul is talking about, this process of becoming more and more sanctified. Perhaps you're familiar with the Old Testament, the tabernacle and the temple, there were always objects that were used that were sanctified or set apart for them to be used in the temple or the tabernacle. The priests who had to serve, they were also set apart and they were also given holy garments to serve the Lord. And these mortal bodies that you and I exist in, we have members that we also have to dedicate to the Lord, to sanctify, to set them aside for God to use. Why? Because God has already paid the redemption price for us. So that we might be useful to him as his holy people where he dwells, where he can now display his righteousness and his purity and his goodness and his holiness. And it requires of us this daily decision, as Douglas Moo put it, to use these bodies of ours for righteousness and not for unrighteousness. Yes, every day we need to make a conscious and deliberate decision to dedicate our members to be used for righteousness. Because the body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, Paul would say when he was speaking of the body of the temple of the Holy Spirit. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Flee from sexual immorality. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit with you. And so until the tendencies of this old self or the habits that we once used to engage in, until they are regularly broken, then we still have to make that daily conscious decision to dedicate our bodies and members for God's use. So we're instructed not only do not present, but instead present. And isn't that the way it is with all habits? You have to leave some habits behind and take up new ones, right? Sometimes our actions have to be conscious and deliberate until they become a habit, until we have used to doing that. Because a long-term habit then becomes a description of your character. Let me give you another example. Maybe you are characterized as a messy, disorganized person. Okay, and then your, the person you marry happens to be someone who loves neatness and orderliness. How are you going to live together? If you are always a messy person, you always leave your bed un, unmade and you never put your clean clothes away. Well, the way you become that way is every day you make that conscious decision that when you step out of bed, the first thing you do is you make your bed. And when you go to the dryer and you see that there's clothes that are dried, you take them out, you fold them and you put them away, right? Now, sure, maybe one morning you, you, you hit the snooze button too many times and you're late. You jump in the shower, you're off to work and you left your bed unmade. Does that mean that you're no longer a neat person? No, it just means that one morning you were too busy to do it. But what are you characterized by? You see, that's the point is that when you put something into habit again and again, 
then people know you as a neat and orderly person, or in the other case, a messy, disorganized person, right? But in order for you to be, go from a messy, disorderly person to someone who's neat and tidy and known for it, it requires a daily decision to do that. And that's the thing. When you sow an action, you'll reap a habit. And when you sow a habit, you'll reap a character. Even Ralph Waldo Emerson is quoted as saying, you sow a thought and you reap an action. You sow an action and you reap a habit. You sow a habit and you reap a character. And you sow a character and you reap a destiny. And that's the way it is with any character qualities, whether you're talking about a healthy diet, a healthy lifestyle, healthy relationships. A single deviation does not describe your character. So don't let a single lapse in judgment or momentary weakness determine the rest of your trajectory to this freedom in Christ, this life that you can live in God, in righteousness. If you give in to temptation or if a stressful situation causes you to respond in anger, don't let that make you believe that you'll never be Christ-like and that you'll always fail. You, you're not characterized by one action. You're characterized by a lifetime of habits. I can almost imagine some of you, perhaps you're on a first date with someone and you find out the other person enjoys running as their hobby. And it just so happened that that morning you set your New Year's resolution in place and, and you, you, for the first time you ran that morning. And because suddenly your date says that they're interested in running, you say, oh, I'm a runner. <laughs> no, you just started running today. You're not a runner yet. But if you continue to run two times a week, three times a week for the next six months, then you can tell your date, I'm a runner. So don't get discouraged by the occasional, occasional sin. Yes, we know it displeases God. Yes, it is harmful. Yes, every sin will lead us to destruction. And yes, it is so evil, it requires the death of God's Son to forgive. But God tells us as well that if we turn away from our sin and if we ask for forgiveness, that His grace is greater than our sin. And so the daily decision must still be made to use our members of our body as instruments of righteousness, not of instruments of unrighteousness. You might feel like you're powerless, but remember you're not. So let me just sum up here that Christ-like righteous behavior, one that pleases God, the one that brings blessing and gives us this true lasting satisfaction will take time for de to develop. And yes, sometimes God makes an instantaneous, miraculous transformation in one particular area of our life. Praise God for that. But in most other areas, it's going to take a commitment to daily dedicate the members of our body for instruments of righteousness. And we have to believe, first of all, this truth that you are dead to sin and alive to God. And you have to choose also, you're not going to live under the previous ruler's sin and then make this deliberate and conscious effort to present the members of your bodies as instruments of righteousness. God has set us free from sin so that we can be his instruments of righteousness. And if you're looking for words to use as you dedicate yourself to the Lord, take the words of Francis Ridley Havergal. Take my life and let it be consecrated to thee. Take my moments and my days, take my hands, take my feet, take my voice, take my lips, take my silver and gold, take my intellect. All of these things, she has a wonderful set of ways to say of what to use her hands for, what to use her feet for. Let us pray. Oh Lord God, we thank you that in Christ we have the victory. <laughs> thank you, Lord God, that sin will not have dominion over us. And we know how much, Lord, that sometimes we fail. But Lord, we pray that the truth of your word would sink deep into our hearts that are ready to receive it. Whatever area of sin that we struggle with, whatever habits we still need to make, Lord, point them out to us today. Let us feel the conviction of, that, of your Holy Spirit in that particular area you want us to address today. And Lord, we also pray that you would give us not only the sensitivity in our hearts instead of the callousness, but the sensitivity to hear your voice speak to us and to pursue that which pleases you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.